for watching. Welcome to the stream. Uh, I just chatted. Uh, Anaya's uh, just already posted a comment. I just posted a comment. So if you're commenting, just comment. Let me know where you're from. Uh, and really, really happy that you guys are here. I'm going to give it a minute because we're not supposed to start for a minute. <laughs> Jesse Coatstacker. Jesse and I are from the same state, but he's really, really, really far away. That the only time I ever see him is if we're going to the same conference. <laughs> it's a big state y'all live in. Yeah. If you drive across the country, then I'm always counting down the states and I always kind of feel relieved once I get to Texas and then I'm like, and then I'm like, oh, I forgot it's like 10 hours to get to, I live in Austin. So, uh, okay, but we're right on time. It is, it is, it is one o'clock central. Hello, Dominic. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, my name's Karen. I'm in Austin, Texas, one o'clock central, 2 p.m. Eastern. And welcome to our, uh, to our stream, to our stream analysis paralysis. It's titled Analysis Paralysis, Building the Right Search Index for Your App. But I am calling it internally my Atlas Search Dream Team Stream because here you see all my super expert uh, search technology panelists here on, here on the side. And I'm super excited that they're going to be here. I am going to, I'm going to, oh, that's such a good question. Jose. We answered that question in the early part of this thing, so I can't wait. I can't wait to tell you. Um, we are talk. So if you if you turned in, you you might have seen some of our tutorials, some of our streams. Uh, we have a lot of sort of search search has been around for a couple of years now. We have a lot of search tutorials and blog articles and how to. So maybe you can get up and running and search quite quickly. But this stream is more focused on my Atlas Search Dream Team stream is more focused on uh, indexes and analyzers, what they are, how they work together so that you can use them together to create the best search index for your application. So at the end of the stream, we're going to go into a lot of detail. Uh, but at the end, you should feel more empowered by a deeper knowledge of basically every level, how to create queries, how to create indexes, and how to create the right index for the right results at the best performance. So with that, I want to introduce my dream team stream. Let me get Marcus back in here. Um, this is my super expert panelist. Why don't we let you guys introduce yourselves in order of, I guess, seniority at MongoDB, Evan. Uh, sure. Hi, uh, my name is Evan Nixon. I've uh, been with the Alice Search team for just about uh, four years, working on all sorts of fun search features and uh, excited to be here chatting with everyone. Yeah, my, my name is Marcus. Uh, I've been with uh, the Atlas Search team at MongoDB for just over two years, and I've been with Lucene and MongoDB separately forever. <laughs> or like a long time half the half the time is eric <laughs> my turn um hi i'm eric hatcher i am uh the newest member of this awesome dream team here um i uh, have been at mongodb for about three weeks now i'm uh, dev rel on the search aspect and uh but I've been a long time been Lucene. I'm a Lucene committer. I've been the co-author of two editions of Lucene in Action, the book, and uh, just been super psyched to be here working on uh, Lucene under the covers of MongoDB. So, so Eric is like he said he's he's only been here three weeks. So I feel a little guilty looping him in to do the stream with us, but he. Um, I mean, I'm only human. I mean, he's here. Right? So it's just funny because not only has he written books, he's written these libraries. So as we do research uh, on some of the Lucene stuff, I might discover a library that he authored 
And so I'm like, instead of, I stop reading the documentation and I'll just slack him <laughs> and ask him. So, so welcome, welcome, Eric. Welcome guys. Thank you. Uh, so what we have, uh, I keep clicking on the wrong screen, sorry. So as we go through the stream today, this is sort of the roadmap, the game plan of what we're, what we're going through. I'm gonna start, I, I mentioned we're gonna focus on search analyzers and indexes today and some complex queries, but uh, I'm gonna start with an with a Atlas search refresher because we can't talk about those things without kind of uh, reminding you what Atlas search is and how easy it is to build on it. So we'll create an index inside the Atlas interface We'll compose a basic search query and we'll talk about scoring and modifiers. After that, then we're going to go more into uh, what an Atlas search index is uh, and the different analyzers that you can create directly in the interface with Atlas search. Then we're going to go to Evan. And Evan, who is our Atlas search lead engineer, he's going to um, you know, split the atom. He's going to say, like, I'm going to talk about analyzers, but then he's really, really going to talk about analyzers. He's going to talk about some advanced use cases when you might want to use them. And he'll talk about custom analyzers and how, how you can create them and some of the things you might want to think about when you're creating them. We'll talk about, uh, Eric's going to talk about explain plans and some performance issues that we, that, that, uh, some performance guidelines that you might want to take in place, some ways to sort of help you figure out what you're doing if you're going down the right path. And then as we wrap up today, you're going to walk away with some solid rules of thumb, some best practices. And I'm also going to show you a couple of uh, online resources that you can use as you start developing for Atlas search indexes. So these are hosted, these are online, and you can start using them right away. Um, that being said, this is a stream. I'm watching all the I'm watching all the chats. So this is basically a road trip. Road trip. This is where we were planning on going. But um, just like with any good road trip with good buddies, if you guys see something that you want to take a closer look at or whatever, we're happy to stop, uh, answer questions along the way, and talk about any sort of specific use cases you have. This is just cool. I will warn you that with my dream team here, these three, they can get quite, um, it's, they can go quite deep and in no time they'll start speaking this like search, this language that only search savant triplets speak with each other. And you'll know when we get there because my eyes will glaze over and uh, I'll just smile and nod. And if you find that you are in the same boat with me, uh, this stream will be on um, maybe they're talking about something that you aren't ready to absorb today, but you'll be ready to absorb later. So if you're an advanced user, there's something here for you. If you're a new user, there's something here for you. But this stream is going to be in our MongoDB channel for a while. I'll go back in later, put in some timestamps so you can sort of jump around and, and take the aspects of it that you, that you need when you need it. So with that, I want to spend a few minutes just kind of reminding everybody about uh, oh, what Atlas Search is. And if you're new to Atlas Search, uh, uh, then I'm telling you what it is. So we'll start by building our basic Atlas Search query. So to build something in Atlas Search and MongoDB Atlas Search, you'll need to be familiar with uh, an aggregation, with our aggregation framework. If you already use MongoDB, you may already know the aggregation framework. It's basically you take a series of documents, you can apply different stages to it that'll transform the results into the next stage, apply something else into the next stage, et cetera. So what this means for you is uh, I use aggregation all the time. I use it to clean data, I use it to make new collections, I use it to analyze the data I have. So if you're using it for these things, then you already know what you need to know in order to create an Atlas search query, because an Atlas search query is an aggregation pipeline where dollar search is the first stage in that query. So with that, let's uh, go to a quick example. I'm going to use a um, I'm going to use an oldie but goodie here in our. So I have an Atlas cluster here on the screen. 
Uh, this is on a free cluster. If you sign up for Atlas, you don't have to even use a credit card to, to do this, to spin up a cluster for you. And you can download the sample data. So I'm using the sample data. I'm going to use the movies collection inside the sample Influx database. And you can see here that maybe you can see here uh, that we have 23,000 uh, documents inside our movie collection. And they have strings. They have dates. They have uh, arrays of strings. They have numbers. And then if we create, if we create an Atlas search query on this, we'll be able to query across, search across all of those different fields. But the first thing we need to do is create an Atlas search index. We need to index these documents. So um, you could use the JSON editor to do that. Evan is going to give you some later, it's going to give you some index definitions that are in JSON. So if you wanted to play around with it, you can go here for the JSON editor for that and just paste it in. I'm going to use the visual editor because it's more of a guided experience. And I'm just going to accept all the default settings. Oops. Oh gosh. So I'm going to accept all the default settings. Go back to where I was. The default name. I'm on the sample Inflix movies collection. I want to uh, point out a couple things. We're using by default, we're using the Lucene standard analyzer and we're doing dynamic mapping. So what dynamic mapping means is that we're going to index across all the different fields in your documents. And the good thing about that is, hi, Ibubu. The good thing about that is, is if you um, change your data, if your data grows and it changes shape if you insert if you insert uh, uh, new embedded objects etc those are going to get indexed for you automatically so you don't have to worry about re-indexing this is just going to add things to the index as they arrive so you'll never have to worry about deleting an index and recreating an index in that uh, but it also means uh, here's your first tip um, it also means that it's indexing all those fields so if you're only querying across certain fields, you can you might want to just say, I want to query across those fields. And if you do that, we have the options to refine your index here. So I just wanted to, to, to point that out. So default settings, click create index. And that's basically all you need to do. The, and the index takes no time to, to create. So now that we have the index created on that, I'm going to go to Compass which is a downloadable tool. I just prefer working in Compass. You can do this in the Atlas interface as well. But here's that same movies collection. And I'm going to use this aggregation pipeline builder. It's a nice little tool that we have. Um, the first thing I need is that index name. We created it using the default name. Because it's default, if I leave that line out, it's going to use it default index as long as there's one name that but if not then I'll I'll do whatever so um if I don't have an index created at all this won't work so I'm going to look for Harry Potter oops in the let's say I'm looking for it in the title field and so now you can see that I have here I have a lot of Harry Potter movies here um so that's the most basic sort of search building block that we have. Uh, again, it's an aggregation pipeline, so we can combine them with different stages. So I have a lot of fields here. Um, I am going to use project to sort of simplify my payload. Uh, let me copy and paste what I have here. So I'm just going to get the fields that I want. I just want the title. Um, and the score. So well, let's talk about score a little bit because it's really, really important. Uh, the score, this is a relevance-based score. So this score field, it's not in the original documents. That's why I had to use the meta operator here in project in order to surface the score. Atlas Search is gonna grade each of the documents, all 23,000 documents in our collection based on this relevance. And so there are lots of things to kind of think about relevance, but essentially it's how well your query matches the document. And there are lots of things to affect that score. Now there are different things now that we have this done, we can change the operator. We have lots of different operators to use. I can use phrase. Um, 
that I can use phrase uh, that might change the score that might change the documents in order, but search is going to return the highest scores first. So this most relevant one. So that's going to mean that your users are going to see these first. So if you're looking for something, people tend to only look at the first couple of result, result, uh, results. So we have ways that you could play around with the score. So you can surface the most, the documents that you want your users to see earlier. One, one thing we have is uh, we have a, a score modifiers. We have constant, boost, and we have function score modifier. So now that score of four, if I multiply all the scores by four, now that that um, score of 4.5 or whatever, it goes up to 13.69 because I've boosted it. I've boosted my score by a value of three. So this is something you can think about. Let's say it's a, you have a promotion, some sort of sales promotion that you want your users to see first for something that week. This would be a good way of doing that. Um, so uh, let me see. So that is our uh, basic search query. Let me, with that, I'm going to go and show you your first demo. Let's go take a, uh, a look at the first demo. So this is sort of a preview of some content that I have coming up this fall. We've got World Cup uh, coming up. I think um, Marcus is a big fan of soccer. Evan says he's not. I'm not particularly, I think Eric is. So Eric and Marcus can do that. But here is my, on this, if you go to atlasfruitshocker.com, you can kind of start playing around with this. But this is my sort of dream team. I only have a couple players on it right now. Um, but if we wanted to, so this app, like as you start typing out, actually, let me refresh this. Let's refresh. So as you start typing out things, you can see how, the uh, queries sort of build out here on the right. So we have different types of queries. We can do uh, text. We could do, which is one I showed you in Compass. We could do wildcard. So now we have a, a different wildcard query. So I can do a uh, wildcard would be like, if I don't know the letters, if I don't know how to spell any of these complicated soccer games, I can use a star and you can see now I can see like uh, th these different players that have an S and N and Y uh, somewhere in these terms. And then I have autocomplete and autocomplete would show, um, autocomplete would show different things here. So you can sort of play around with this. This will help you figure, figure things out. But um, I want to, actually, let me not do autocomplete. Let me do text. Sorry, I gotta get that off the screen. So I'm gonna do text. I'll do the, the first thing I wanna do is, I, I, you know, I don't know tons of players, but I know there's a messy. Uh, so if I do messy, you can see I have all these different players. I have fuzz, fuzzy matching here, so they don't match messy perfectly. There's Moosey and Amelia, whatever. But I want to put, what side is messy on? Let's put him here, it's good to know. <laughs> But I know that there's only one messy, right? So here, top red is actually uh, the Atlas search score that I have, this badge. But underneath here is the overall score, which is basically how FIFA rates all these players. So when I do a search, and I mentioned to you, like, <laughs> don't pick Ronaldo. Peter Kim is actually like an example. I did pick Ronaldo, but I thought he was from Brazil, so I didn't find him for a while. Um, so, so when I when I do Messi and I want the Messi, so I want to get the guy who's the best first. The so one thing I'm going to do, I mentioned custom scoring, so I can do function scoring here, which just adds the FIFA score to the relevant score. So I know I'm going to get the the best. The, we have lot. You don't have to add it. You can multiply it. You can do log one p lots of complicated things, but adding is, is simple for me. So now you see I have Messi as my first example, and he is the highest overall score. So if I want to put him in my team, then I just hit the green heart and he adds here. So you guys can play around this, create your own World Cup teams. Um, but the other thing that I have is, so if you if I didn't, if the way I did Ronaldo was, the other way to use this is, I'm not going to pick, I'm not going to put him on the team. I'm just, he's on my brain now. 
Peter. So, so if I did Ronaldo, here you see that search query coming up. Actually, let me reset because I I still have function score in there. And I don't want to have it. So if I go to advanced scouting, now I can play around with different things. So I did I did Ronaldo. So this is that basic query, but I can combine it with Ronaldo from. Uh, I'll do Portugal. I won't. I won't put him on the team. But you can see how I kind of uh, can play around. Now this is that part of the query. This is that search building block, and you can see how I added it here. And so I can do. I can do different things. I could add different uh, uh, fields here, and you could see how they would add different search building blocks and how you can combine them inside of the same search stage. Neymar's in there, Jose. <laughs> Neymar. So any of you guys, you have this app, atlassearchsoccer.com. You can build your own team. And I, I don't, you can put Neymar in every position if you want to tell you the truth. So anytime you click this, it writes to your local uh, device. So everybody can create their own team, writes these people to their own local device. And then if you don't want them on your team, all these guys, I want on my team actually, but I'll, I'll take off Messi just for the heck of it. If you don't, if you want to relegate them, then just click on and they go away. So this is something just to show you that we have uh, how the operators can affect the search results you want. I wanted to get the right Messi first. So, so that was, I used a function scoring in that. So different ways that you can play around with learning how to build search queries. But sometimes, even though you know the different operators we have, and even though you know the different sort of scoring modifiers we have, things that you play, sometimes things don't match exactly. And that's the point of the stream here today. So if they don't match exactly, it might be because of the index you're using. Uh, and more specifically, it might be because of the analyzer. I spent a lot of time on that. I'm sorry, this is a little longer. I get carried away with World Cup coming around. So, uh, I think it was Peter who had the question. Uh, no, it was, uh, I, I just really got the name. So he asked about a MongoDB index versus a search index, I believe. <laughs> Thanks, Jose. Uh, so a MongoDB, MongoDB typically, you saw how we created that search index in a different place than where we create regular MongoDB indexes. Search indexes are different. MongoDB uses typically uh, a, a self-balancing B tree index. Um, so in, this is a set of MongoDB documents that underscore ID comes in every document. It is always indexed. Uh, and then we have ways to create different indexes depending on your query patterns. You can create them on specific fields. You can create compound indexes, unique indexes, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm sorry, let me just go back to stay here. Uh, the search index is an inverted index. So um, the best way I have to sort of compare a MongoDB index to an inverted index, a search index, is a walk through an example. So if we have these MongoDB documents, best and worst teams of the NFL uh, as document three, and I wanted to search all of these documents for this text, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. In order to prepare this corpus of data to search over it, then we break that down through a process called analysis into different terms called tokens. So using the Lucene standard analyzer, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It's gonna break it down into these terms or tokens. It was the best of times. Lower cases, everything removes punctuation and that's what you're left with. So now we have those terms in our inverted index and they will point back to our MongoDB documents. So you can see it was in document four, best is in documents two and three. So I often think about, it helps me to understand inverted indexes when I think about the index in the back of the book. So if I had the complete works of Shakespeare, I wouldn't, if I wanted to find uh, Lady Macbeth's out, out, damn spot, I wouldn't pick up the beginning of the book and, and start reading every page to find it. I would go straight to the back of the book in the index that they wrote when they wrote the book just, and it'll say scene five, act one. Uh, and then I'll split from there. So 
Now the question is, how do you know what terms to write in the back of the book that you can point to it? And our analyzers, that's where analyzers come in. Remember the process of breaking these down is called uh, analysis and it's done by analyzers. So with um, a white space analyzer, it just removes white space. It keeps the casing, it keeps the commas and the periods, all the punctuation. So times, if we, unless we had a comma or a period, it wouldn't match if we were to search for something like that. Um, an English analyzer, I find really helpful because it removes a lot of words. It removes, uh, we call them, it removes, it was the, it will remove A's and A's and those really common words in English that you find everywhere. So Eric gave a great example about, what is it called? To be or not to be? The only thing that would return and that would be not. That right? was Google. That was the way Google used to work. Long ago. <laughs> okay. So, so the other thing is it recognizes, you'll see that instead of times, that time is there, but it also recognizes uh, verbs and tense. So running will stem to run and, uh, you know, different things, walking and things like that. So you can, and it'll do possessive as well. So we can get some more example. Yeah, stop words. So we move the stop words in this as well. And different languages have different stop words. So if you use French or Spanish or whatever, the little, it, these Lucene analyzers will understand the nuances in each of those languages. So if these are the three tokens, these are how they map back. We have lots of different analyzers that have lots of different rules and I can never remember all those rules. So like any uh, programmer, <laughs> like any coder, I like who, you know, I, I, write, I wrote an app, so I never have to remember anything anymore and I never have to look up the documentation. And so I'm going to share this app with you and give you a quick idea of how it works. So this one is at atlassearchindexes.com. And if you, uh, you can see here in this tool, the first thing I want to point out to you is all the different uh, analyzers that we have. I wrote down some basic rules on each one. And then down here, I have sort of the basic golden rules that I, I remember summar summarized, lower cases, remove punctuations, keys, accents. And so we could change through everything. Uh, we did standard English, simple, separates at non-characters, white space we did. Keyword is the only one I can remember because it keeps everything exactly the way it is. And then so if I, in addition to knowing those uh, rules, now that I know those rules, I actually have some text here that we can search through. So uh, I had mentioned this one. I had mentioned uh, English matching different verbs. So you can see uh, I listened to Mike Lynn's podcast. So if I were to do um, listened here with... If I were to do listens instead of listened, if I were to use the standard index, actually, let me do it so it matches first. So if you're looking for this term, click your analyzer, and if it matches, then it'll show up here highlighted. Uh, if I were to do listens and it doesn't match, it wouldn't return a match because it doesn't match the word exactly. But if I were to change the analyzer to English, it does match. So little things like that you can sort of play around with and see. Uh, the other cool example that I like a lot is uh, with an email address. Uh, I'm, I'm using a mongodb.com email address, but you can see with this, you could see the sort of tokens that these would result in. So if I were to look for, with an English analyzer, if you're looking for certain email addresses, let's say if they're, they end in edu or their Gmail or something like that, you could only find it, whoops, I wouldn't be able to find it with English in this email address, but I would be able to find it, see, I can never remember, I would be able to find it with simple, and it would be the only one with simple. Um, so if this is helpful to you, I'm going to show you one more tiny way if you don't like the sort of examples I have here right now, and you want to sort of look up on your own, do one more quick demo of this before I move on to a cool use case. Um, if you wanted to, whoops, yeah, tokens. 
So if you wanted to put in your own uh, sample data here, let's say, Marcus, give me something to say. <laughs> Marcus likes stop words. How about that? Yeah. Not a very good one for you. Marcus has so many more yeah. cultural yeah. things I can say about Marcus. What do you think? I, I think that's good. I would say Marcus, Marcus likes, likes stop words at the at the end. At the disco. At, at, at the disco. disco. <laughs> okay, so when you're using this app, and I always forget this, make sure to hit submit because and make sure you get that green check before you do it. So now if I were to do I don't know why this is showing up this way. Let me go back to standard. So now if I were to do um, like, and I'm using, which analyzer you want to do, Marcus? I want to use the English analyzer. Okay. So I'm going to use like, and remember the word is like, so will this match? And it does match, but you know, I can change my analyzer and it doesn't match. So. If you have emails or something like that you want to check out, this is this is uh, something you can do. Yeah, so be wary of the standard analyzer if you're only using one language. Because you see like doesn't match likes. But you probably want it to match in most cases. There are only a few cases. Marcus, is it me or does he sound funny? I mean, he sounds very cool, but it sounds, it sounds a little oh, really? Yeah, you, have, you sound a little staticky. But you sound like a technology monster. Try again. What about now? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, good. Wow. Perfect. I, I like those headphones too. I think you let me try them out in London last year. So, um, so these are some ways that you could test your own data. Uh, and I actually want to point out one example that I found out that just on, on my last example before I give it to before I give it to Evan is um, we you know, like all developers that you really don't care about it until you hit a bug with it. And uh, it's so easy to get an index created and, and start searching across it that I tend to kind of gloss over that and not realize the value. But when I was writing this application, the software application, I actually struggled. This is where I discovered the value of something. So let's say I was looking for teams for Manchester United, players just for Manchester United. And whoops, actually, let me start over because so I have something here in the interface where I can pick my analyzer because I ran into this bug and I thought it was a really cool. I mean, it's not a bug. It's I ran into this mistake. So uh, and I thought it was a really good lesson. So I just use the standard analyzer because I was creating across it. So if I use a standard analyzer, I'm looking for Manchester United. You see, so here's facets, by the way. You see that I have 697 players for Manchester United. And even though I checked Manchester United, I'm getting results from West Ham United and Manchester City. So now you guys know that Manchester United is going to result in two tokens. Manchester and United is going to match on those. But if I know, if I use the keyword analyzer, do search. Now I get indeed the Manchester United um, and only Manchester United thing. So because I know exactly what I want those terms to be, if it's something like if it's a checkbox inside the user interface, this is a really good case for that. So with that, I'm just going to, so those are two apps that you can use and learn from. But with that, I'm just going to leave with these my next sort of uh, best practices thing, and, and Eric will go more into this later because he has more experience with it. But I always think about it when I am, first of all, whenever I create an application, I just use the most basic index first, and then I fine tune as I go, but that's just me. But think about your data and think about how you're gonna query your data and what it is that you're expecting to find, what you want your tokens to be. So if you if it's emails and you're looking for whatever your company name is, you know you might want to use a simple analyzer or something like that, uh, keywords, etc. So think about your data, how you want to break into tokens, and then knowing what tokens you want, then you could pick your analyzer, and you could put your hello fellow Earthlings. You could pick your analyzer. You specify your analyzer inside of your index definition, 
And then that index definition, remember, is always the first line inside of your search query. So you use one, uh, one index for your search query. You could use a couple different analyzers within your index, but one index definition per search query. Cool. <laughs> so I don't see any questions. I <laughs> Mark is the election. So with that, I'm going to, Evan, you ready? Yeah. yeah. So uh, Evan is going to, I presented analyzers like they're a black box. <laughs> Like it goes in one slide, it comes out the other, but Evan's going to open up the black box here in a second. So let me stop sharing my screen and start sharing his. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks, Karen. I, um, so I want to kind of expand on uh, analyzers and everything that Karen's um, talked about so far. Um, and I want to start by kind of motivating, breaking down the parts of an analyzer as a way for us to learn how to make a custom analyzer. And we're going to go through that kind of at the end of this walkthrough. Uh, but right now, before we make a custom analyzer, I want to talk a little bit about what the parts of a custom analyzer are, because it's helpful to understand, you know, what the parts are when you're trying to put together how to, you know, make these things do what you want to do. So let's get into what an analyzer is and what the parts are and how it works. So an analyzer defines, it's really kind of like a pipeline. We're taking input text, we're transforming it by um, you know, taking the stream of characters, chunking it up or tokenizing it, and then kind of doing some transformation on those tokens. There are three different kinds of building blocks. There are zero or more character filters, which are like kind of the first stage. Uh, so when you have your, you know, your input um, large, set of characters in a row, you're going to pass them through either none of these or, you know, one of them or several, and it's happening kind of in a sequential way, right? So from your input text, you're either going to go through your first character filter, or you're going to go straight to a tokenizer. Um, you know, but we're kind of thinking of this as this pipeline. After character filters, we are going to go through one tokenizer, and that's going to take kind of this big string uh, and we're going to kind of cut it up into little tokens. So we're sort of, you know, when we say tokenizing, we're really kind of taking the long character string and cutting it up into little indexable units tokens. Uh, after going through the tokenizer, we are going to go through zero or more token filters. So we don't have to go through token filters, but, you know, after going through the tokenizer, we can kind of have these additional transformation things that are working on a token by token basis. Uh, these could be removing tokens. This could be combining tokens together. Um, so that's kind of the high level view. Everyone with me so far? Cool. So um, this is kind of a graphic that is a, I hope is like a little bit more of a visual on what we just talked about. Uh, so if you take kind of your input text and you think of it as this string uh, you can imagine that passing through a set of character filters, a tokenizer, and then kind of going through this stream and coming out the other end as this set of quick brown fox jump. You know, these are sort of the tokens that have passed through the whole analysis chain. Uh, so getting into more about like the individual components and how they differ from one another, uh, the first step is kind of talk about character filters. Um, Character filters are probably are less used than the other components of this, so I don't want to spend too much time on them. Uh, but they do have a function, and they are useful in cases. Um, but character filters are really um, used to kind of clean up incoming text before tokenizing, and you know maybe sort of do some transformation that you want to do before we're cutting things into our discrete units. Uh, so an example of this might be a HTML stripping character filter, which is maybe doing some sort of transformation, uh, where it's removing uh, tags like P and B here. So we're taking this, you know, HTML, we're taking the tags out. We've now got a string without the HTML stuff in it. Uh, all right, so after we go through character filters, we are now going to tokenize our text. Um, there's exactly one tokenizer per analyzer. Uh, it's the only thing you really need to have an analyzer. 
uh, and a tokenizer is what takes, you know, you're going to take this input set, uh, input string, the cafe sync was leaking, and we're cutting it up uh, into the cafe sync was leaking. Uh, in this case, kind of as delimited by white space. So after going through the tokenizer, we've got kind of like a, we're going to go through um, zero or more token filters. Um, these are kind of operating on a token by token basis. And these are examining, maybe modifying uh, each token, maybe removing some or combining some together. Uh, an example of this is maybe to do something like stemming, where we would take um, words and try to trim off suffixes to make them uh, reduce to a common root. So in this case, you can kind of see the word leaking turns into leak. Maybe leaks also turns into leak or leaked, uh, things like that. Cool. So to sum all that up, we've got zero more character filters, which are taking our input text and doing some transformation before we're cutting it up. We've got the tokenizer, which is cutting up our text into tokens. And then we've got a handful, zero or more token filters, which are doing some transformation on a token by token basis. Uh, so here's kind of an example of what you know this might look like. We've got you know our input text. We're going to do an HTML strip character filter, white space tokenizer, um, and then a token filter after it. Um, yeah, so that's you know that's kind of a high level uh, view of what this might look like. So I want to show what this might look like in an index definition, just to kind of give a full picture. Uh, so I'm jumping into syntax here, and I want to kind of look at this in a little more detail later. But the point I want to kind of highlight here is in an Atlas Search JSON index definition, we've sort of got we've got this analyzer section, which is specifying you know maybe some custom analyzers. We've got a custom analyzer. You can have uh, a number of these, and then we're sort of referencing it in our index by name. And that's sort of how you would use one of these. Cool. So let's go through an example of kind of what it might look like to iterate on an analyzer and kind of uh, let's, let's get into that. So um, I want to kind of walk through an example using some data in one of the sample data sets in Atlas. This is the sample training trips data set. And I want to look at data in the station name variables. So there's this data in this collection that kind of is like street cross streets. And we're going to kind of go through an example of what it would look like if you want to run a query over those. So you know, you've got this information. It's formatted in a certain way, and we're going to kind of try to use search to build some analyzers in an index and run a query and find stuff like this. All right, let's jump back. So I've kind of pre-made a few indexes, but I want to look at them. We'll start with the first one and kind of go through them. Um, if we take kind of the um, you know the simplest approach. We might start with an index definition using. Hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are these spaces in the field names? They are, yeah. Yeah, that's rude. I didn't make the sample data set, you know? That's not your fault. That's not your fault. MagaDB. Not blaming you, Evan. Just, I didn't see that. Go ahead. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's good fun, you know? Um, yeah, we so right. Name, we didn't name the field. <laughs> it's not our fault. Uh, yeah. You know, it's um, in any case, this is the way this data looks. Uh, we do, um, you know, if we do want to start with an index that is using kind of a simple Lucene standard built in analyzer, uh, we're going to, we can do that like this and we can specify just to index these two fields that we were looking at in our last example. Um, 
And let's run some queries over that and see how well that does. Excuse my jumping back and forth here. All right, so I have here kind of preset a search query to run on this cross street index, which was the name of our first iteration. Uh, let's run some queries. So if I'm, you know, a user, if I'm someone typing something into a search box, maybe I'm typing in like 51st. Yeah. Let's see what happens here. All right, we get nothing for 51st Street. How about just 51st? Uh, what about 51? Okay, so we get some stuff for 51. That's that's good. Uh, what if we want to do, say, East 51st Street? Uh, or maybe E. Okay, so, so we can see kind of there's like a handful of inputs or queries that we want to try and maybe find. And we're not doing as well as we want with our first index. Uh, so let's go back and see if we can make an analyzer that will transform our data and our query input in a way that makes it better able to, to find things based on what a user is putting in. Cool. So if you kind of uh, will hand wave over this kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, so imagine we kind of thought about this for a while. And maybe we want to use a custom analyzer that we've designed to do some uh, analysis on these station names. So we'll reference this station name custom analyzer here on the same two fields. And let's look at this station name custom analyzer. So we've defined one character filter here, the mappings character filter that maps the four letters of cardinal directions to you know, east, north, south, and west. So we're sort of expanding E, uh, all the letters to be this full word. Um, we are interested in capturing words like, you know, we're interested in the character 51st. Maybe we really want to consider that as the number and the letter independently. Uh, so we can do some sort of a regex where we capture either a string of characters or a string of numbers. And maybe we want to also lowercase everything because uh, we're not particularly, a lowercase and an uppercase version of a street are sort of, we want to consider those to be the same thing. Cool, so let's see how we do with this one. So we're querying our V1. Uh, let's we'll, we can start with 51st Street. Okay, so we're seeing results for 51. We can try something like East 51st Street. We can try 51st Street. Um, okay, so we've captured a few more cases. Uh, Maybe, uh, but we probably haven't really captured all of them. So what if we're interested in finding something more like South Street? Not seeing a lot of results in the top with South Street in them. But if we go to the, eventually if we go over here, there are a few that have South Street as a start or a stop station. Uh, Oh, that's because I had a typo. Is there any way to make the screen bigger? Uh, well, or I can just wear my glasses. So. Maybe. Oh, thank you. That's good. Did that do anything? Yes, it did. Thank you. Cool. So we're seeing streets that have S in them. Uh, but maybe we really want to be doing a match on something more like the more like this, or we want this to be a little higher. So uh, let's go back to our index and let's see what we can do and kind of if we can do something to make us capture that case. 
All right, so we could imagine if we wanted to capture this case, we might try an approach where we are still indexing our station name fields, but let's try indexing them and analyzing them in two different ways. The first way, we'll use the same station name custom analyzer, and we'll do that for both fields. And the separate way, we're going to call our shingling multi-field for each of these. Uh, and in that one, we're going to use a new uh, custom analyzer, which we'll talk about below. Uh, and I'll explain kind of a little more about what this is going to do. At a high level, shingling is sort of a process where you can um, combine sets of tokens in a row. So maybe uh, instead of searching for 51 and ST independently, you search for tokens 51 ST, ST, and the next thing. So you sort of combine things in sequence and take kind of a sliding window as you go along. A little bit like shingles overlapping on a roof. That's a better analogy than my quesadilla analogy. <laughs> Wait, so. I do like a good quesadilla analogy. Um, okay, so we have our we got our first analyzer. Uh, we've taken it actually kind of. Uh, oops, sorry, this is a little bit tricky. Uh, added a few different cases for the different mappings. Maybe we noticed wanted to match different. Uh, you know, uppercase, lowercase for these. We've so we've kind of made that a little bit better. Maybe everything else is really the same. Uh, and say we've taken we take our new uh, station name custom analyzer. We've done the same expansion sort of mapping from cardinal directions to east, west, north, south. Uh, and after our lower casing token filter. We are combining our tokens into sets of two and three. We are also tokenizing using the standard tokenizer instead of splitting up numbers and letters. Um, and we can kind of see if this will satisfy our use case. So if we run queries like this, we can still Oh, let me talk about this query a little bit. So when we're querying for our text, we can query against um, our, our two paths that are being analyzed with the kind of default non-multi analyzers. These are the station name analyzers. And also using the multi shingling analyzers. So this is sort of doing a search over four independently indexed fields, and we're kind of combining the score of all of these. And you know, we can kind of use that to hit a variety of cases that maybe we have a hard time capturing with just one. Uh, cool. So we can kind of do searches for the cases we looked at before. Um, we can also search for things like South Street see things like this show up a little better and uh, you know we can get a little bit of a better um, we can set aside that case in a little better way so we can here use multi fields um, with custom analyzers we can use them to each capture a subset of the cases we want to try and target and we can combine them to kind of have a more holistic querying and analyzing approach. That's awesome. Do you have, uh, Evan, did you and Marcus, when you guys talk a lot, you meet a lot with our customers and stuff, do you help them kind of figure out uh, the best times to use custom analyzers? And, and yeah, sure. Yeah, it's something we um, definitely think about a fair bit. Oh, good. Then I'll just go ahead and give everybody your phone number here. In the chat. <laughs> just kidding. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> um, we do have some helpful tutorials, and um, the the docs have some great examples of using these. Uh, that will be at the end of this presentation too, which um, hopefully will be super 
helpful for you. So I hate to do this, but do you mind if I like dumb it down a little bit for with my food analogy? I'll go, it'll go super fast. Cause, I love that. Cause um, so I saw, I saw Evan teaches me a lot of these things when I try and write a lot of content for the stream. And every time he talks, you know, like I said, my eyes kind of glaze over and then I think of food. <laughs> So every time I learn something, I always have some sort of food metaphor. So the one thing I found really fascinating about uh, custom analyzers when he's talking about custom analyzers is, like I said, I always thought about analyzers as a box. But he says, you know, my big takeaways were you have these like characters and you could put you apply an array of different character filters on it and you could have zero or many. And then you have then you tokenize it. You only have one tokenizer. You did it done. And then after you tokenize it, then you can apply different tokenizers and that is all done on its way of searching. So I kept thinking, you know, so we analyze things to prepare for search and you prepare your food to, to prepare to eat it. So the metaphor that I, I use to keep in mind is uh, like if you're cooking something, so let's say you, you have these carrots, your character, oops, sorry, your character uh, uh, analyzers could be like your raw data will be your raw carrots. And then your character filters that you apply before, that's how you prepare your uh, raw data to be tokenized. So I might take off the, the green stuff, I might wash it, I might peel it. So those would be the three character filters I would do for that. And then I cut it. And you only cut it once. You cut it Julian. You could cut it. You know, you could cut it in these little circles. Or you could cut it in cubes. You could cut it. But you you cut it typically one way the whole time. And then finally, now that you have these tokens, what's what? Are you, what else are you going to do to eat it? You could just eat it the way it is. You don't have to do anything. Or you can glaze it. You can boil it. You could broil it or whatever. And you could put parsley on it. So those would be the different sort of token filters. So that's one day I'm going to have a cooking show about this and you guys can, I'll take requests. So that's that's my dumbed down version of everything Evan said so that I understand it. So uh, with that, let's go to, uh, let's go to Eric, our new recruit. Uh, and uh, let's see, which screen is yours, Eric? And then uh, you can take it away. You ready? Yeah, yeah. So thank you, Evan. That was an awesome uh, introduction to how custom analyzers work. Um, again, I'm the the new kid on the block here, so I'm still trying to understand Mongo and how it all integrates. But one of the things that I thought about as we started preparing for this live stream was how would part number searches work in here? I've done a lot of work with e-commerce and and uh, and search as well, and if you have, say, these examples here that's on the screen, you have uh, a space modulator and you've got the part number is Q-36. And then you might have a new and improved one that's a Q-99. Um, and just for demonstration purposes, I put the same part number in two different fields so that we could kind of see how they get analyzed differently um, and get queried differently too. So, uh, you know, when users search for a part number, they're not going to put it in the same format that you have it in your system. You've got it in um, a very canonical form um, and users are going to ignore punctuation. They're going to lowercase things. Um, they might even put in additional punctuation that, that, uh, that you didn't have in the canonical forms. So um, if you used, for example, an out of the box, analyzer situation, this Lucene standard um, here, and you had these two products indexed, when you do the search for Q36 without a space in it, you actually will find no documents. And we'll go into the details of why that is in, in just a minute. Um, if the user in instead did Q space 36, for their query, you actually end up finding both of those products. You find the Q99. Again, we're gonna go into the details of why that is in just a moment. So you can see that the out of the box standard analysis is good for 
general search, but it's not as refined as our specific part number specifications. So what I did to prepare for this was to create a custom analyzer that would take this part number text and do some manipulations on it. So I used that keyword tokenizer that we talked about earlier that keeps the entire text string as one token and then feed that through a token filter, two token filters, in fact. Uh, the first one lowercases the entire string because it's the entire string that's coming out of the previous tokenizer step. And then we run it through a regex and that regex removes all non-alpha numeric characters. So you can see the regex there selects not A to Z and not zero to nine and replaces that with an empty string for all occurrences of it. Um, so Q-36 gets analyzed as Q-36. It takes away the dash and leaves and, and keeps the Q and the 36 together as a single token and lowercases it as well. And to affect this, and just like Evan showed, you have in your index configuration, you define your part num field with an analyzer. And you can also specify a search analyzer. It's redundant in this particular case. I'm using both here um, to use that custom analyzer we just defined. And now when we do a search for Q no space 36, with our custom part number analyzer, we find just this one product that is Q-36. Okay, so now let's try with a space instead of um, a dash and instead of it being all together. So Q space 36, we again find that one product that we were looking for. Okay, so that's kind of shows how a custom analyzer is necessary to have the to to refine your search to find more nuanced type strings. Um, this next screen here shows a way that I thought about this problem and looked at what would happen with all of the various analyzers that are built into Mongo, or at least most of them. And so, and I learned how to do the dot explain method. So if you leverage this dot explain method and kind of try all of the different query analysis that you can do with the same query string, this, uh, this explain output will show you what happened effectively at the Lucene level, at the query level under the cover. So in this particular case, for this one clause against using the standard analyzer, you can see that what happened was it created a Boolean query that effectively is looking for Q or 36. And it doesn't matter the order here, so 36 or Q. And that is why with the standard analyzer, you ended up finding when someone searched for Q space 36, that they found both products because the Q99, when it got analyzed through the standard analyzer, the Q became a separate token. So you're finding all products that have a Q in its part number effectively. Um, but really we just wanted the Q36. Okay, so that's the explain output for that one clause here, which is the uh, standard anal analyzer. And now if we look at what the output is at the low level of the explain for our part number, custom part number analyzer, you can see that clause turns into what's known in Lucene as a term query, which means an exact term match. And it's, it analyzes Q space 36 or Q 36 or Q dash 36 or Q dot, 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 36, Q slash 36, it doesn't matter. The token that comes out is lowercase Q 36 contiguously. 
And so now we have an analyzer that can take our canonical part number and match that with many different expressions that a user might use for that particular part number. And so that showcases a custom analyzer, why you need it, and then the explain output that's possible with, um, with Mongo's uh, commands there so that you can see why things are happening the way they're happening. Um, and that is all I had to say about this particular thing. I just wanted to kind of do that quickly there, but I'm happy to take some questions or whatever we need to do from here. And you're muted as far as I can tell. Here. Thank you very much. Uh, the chat is going to hold quiet. If you guys have questions, like this is a this is a good time. But uh, if not, you can uh, reach out to us on Twitter or or inside of our MongoDB developer forums as well. Um, Marcus, are you are you waving hello goodbye? I wanted yeah, to. Yeah. We've gone a little. We've gone a little over an hour now, so I wanted to kind of wrap it up. Um, I think we covered a lot of material. We got into. We started off really light and got into deep, and we got into some really uh, useful examples for when you guys uh, get stuck. So there were some. Let me show you. Uh, let me just go back to some of those resources that you could find online. I'll put that on the screen. Um, so these are some of the resources that we use on, online. Uh, those are those just are from, from Evan, and then those are the applications. You can go online right now and, and start using Atlas Search Indexes and atlassearchsoccer.com. But um, Eric, I thought it would be fun. Thank you, Peter. I thought it would be, thanks for joining. I thought it'd be fun. You're the newest to the team, but you're the guy who has the most experience with Atlas Search. And I was kind of thinking that maybe you could Tell us about how Atlas Search, you know, why you're at MongoDB, how Atlas Search compares with uh, other platforms, what you like about it, how it's changed, and uh, what you're looking forward to, maybe. That's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> In closing. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I am excited to be here at MongoDB for various reasons. Um, the primary reason is I love Lucene, always have loved Lucene. And it's very exciting to see Lucene being leveraged in this particular area. Um, one of the exciting things is that Mongo combines the data and the database aspect with Lucene, whereas other solutions that are out there are a search engine that is disconnected from the content itself. So um, as you put content into the system, it's being synced right to Lucene and is immediately searchable. So that's a, a pretty tight uh, scenario there. I also, um, again, I've just recently, literally over the last couple of days, become more and more familiar with how the uh, aggregation dollar search operator works and how the analyzers work with the whole system and the multi capability and the combining the clauses and being able to weight them um, actually is kind of a fresh take on uh, in comparison to some of the other systems that are out there that are built on top of Lucene. So there are some very interesting and powerful query capabilities that are available already out of the box with Atlas Search. Um, it certainly is kind of sophisticated to build these expressions, but the power that you have is pretty enormous in terms of um, being able to find um, you know, needles in haystacks. Yeah, it feels like you're unearthing things that are in the ground and, and uh... <laughs> Anyway, so I uh, well, we're super happy to have you here. We lost Marcus. He had another meeting to join to. Um, and I guess that's about it. I shared some of the resources in the chat. Thank you guys so much for joining. Evan, I do you do you have anything in wrapping up? Thank you so much for explaining explaining custom analyzers and how to create them and giving oh, us thanks for thanks for um it's it's been really fun. I'm really excited to share all this stuff and it's um, it's always um, a pleasure. 
and we're just scratching the surface. There's a lot more to come. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye.